Hello and welcome to the Metaphysical Emporium. I'm Marcus Adair, and this is the seventh part of the series I'm calling The Road to Modern Witchcraft. We covered parts one through six in separate videos that are still available on YouTube. In the sixth part of The Road to Modern Witchcraft, we talked about Eleanor Bone, the F-E-R-I tradition, Henry and Cora Anderson, Louise Bourne, Robert Cochran, the Witchcraft Research Association, and Sybil Leak. If you have not checked out those videos, please do so. As always, you can post any questions in the comments or email questions as well. Please subscribe to the channel and like the video. It helps me out a great deal. Also, the Metaphysical Emporium has launched a Twitter page as well as a Facebook page, so please check out those as well. Before we begin, I'm going to apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. Let's talk about Lori Cabot, born March 6, 1933, with the name Mercedes Elizabeth Kersey in Weewoka, Oklahoma. Cabot is an American witch, author, artist, businesswoman, and also known as the official witch of Salem. According to a Boston Globe article by Billy Baker, it all started with a black cat named Molly Boo. One day Molly, one of Lori's two cats, got stuck 50 feet up in a tree, despite the other cat trying to coax it back down. Lori tried calling the local police only to be told to just wait and that the cat would eventually come down. After three days, Molly Boo was still stuck in the tree and Lori had had it. So in true badass fashion, she called the Salem News and said to the person who answered the phone, My cat is stuck in a tree. I am a witch. The cat is my familiar. And I want someone to come and get my cat out of the tree. Needless to say, the attention was almost immediate. Not only did several rescue cars show up to get Molly Boo out of the tree, but so did a photographer and the mayor. Cabot is the founder of the Cabot Science Edition of Witchcraft. She is also the founder of the Witches League for Public Awareness, the WLPA, a group that served as a watchdog to act as an anti-defamation organization aimed at correcting the many misconceptions about witchcraft. Cabot is also a prominent civil rights activist. Cabot claims she is a descendant from a long line of Cabots in Jersey, the largest of the Channel Islands, situated off the southwest coast of England and the northwest coast of France, a place steeped in the lore of witchcraft. According to Cabot, her heritage includes a long line of witches, including a mysterious woman who lived some 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, whose genetic memory Cab Cabot feels that she possesses. Her father was a businessman and a science-orientated man. Cabot developed a lifelong interest in science, which she merged with her interest in witchcraft, the occult, and the paranormal. At age six, Cabot's psychic gifts became apparent, getting Cabot constantly in trouble for discussing information she picked up through extrasensory perception. At age 14, Cabot returned to Boston from California. She embarked on a comparative study of religions and spent much time in the local library. At the local library, Cabot met a woman on the staff who encouraged her to look beyond Christianity for information on paranormal phenomena. This woman would turn out to be a witch and would introduce Cabot to two other witches. At age 16, these witches would school Cabot on the craft and eventually initiate her. After Cabot graduated high school, she became a dancer in Boston's Latin Quarter. Before moving to Salem, Lori was living in the north end of Boston, a struggling divorcee, raising two children. In 1955, Cabot founded the Cabot tradition of the science of witchcraft, originally called Witchcraft as Science. Cabot describes the tradition as Celtic and pre-Gardenerian. The tradition teaches practical magic. It adheres to the Wiccan Reed. It adheres to the threefold law of karma. Classes and workshops in the science tradition continue today. Cabot also teaches classes in witchcraft as religion and art. In the late 1960s, Cabot made a vow that she would live her life totally as a witch. Cabot would wear nothing but traditional witch clothing, which consisted of long black robes, displaying a pentacle, and emulating the goddess by outlining her eyes in black makeup. 
Cabot claimed that this was an ancient tradition to do so. Cabot would have to deal with jokes, aversion, and accusations that her dress was for the purpose of commercial exploitation. Cabot relocated to Salem, Massachusetts, and realized that the people of Salem had no real notion or understanding of modern witches. In the late 60s, Cabot began to teach witchcraft as a science, classes to the public, forming the beginning of her science tradition of witchcraft. Cabot also taught classes for seven years in the Salem State College Continuing Education Program. Cabot opened the witch shop, and um, that did not do very well. It closed in a very short amount of time. Cabot opened another store called Crowhaven Corner, which was successful and became a tourist attraction in Salem. Cabot turned this shop over to her daughter, Jody in the late 70s. I think this store is still around, but no longer owned by any Cabot family member. In the mid-90s, Cabot opened a third store location known as The Cat, The Crow, and The Crown on Pickering Wharf, but later renamed it The Official Witch Shop. I believe this store is still open today. In 73, Cabot established the annual Witches' Ball. The ball is a costume party to celebrate Samhain. Each year, the ball draws an international crowd of participants and media. Circa 1971, Cabot sought to be named the official Witch of Salem, but was denied by the then mayor, Samuel Zoll. In 77, the then governor, Michael Dukakis, signed a citation granting Cabot the title. Um, the Paul Revere Citation, as it is called, is a recogni recognition given to various citizens courtesy of members of the legislature. Cabot received hers for her work with dyslexic children. In 1980, Cabot joined the Salem Chamber of Commerce, serving as a member of the executive board. In 86, Cabot founded the Witches League of Public Awareness. After re the release of the film version of The Witches of Eastwick, John Updike's novel about single suburban women venturing into the occult, Cabot established the Witches League for Public Awareness to counter negative image of her religion in popular culture and the media. Cabot is quoted as saying, Here are three women who have nothing better to do because they are so frustrated sexually than to get involved with witchcraft. They are not witches. If they are anything, they are weekend Satanist. They do not do one witchy thing in the entire film. This group serves as a media watchdog and civil rights advocate for witchcraft. In 87, Cabot entered the Salem uh, mayoral race. Incumbent Anthony V. Salvo made derogatory comments about witchcraft and witches in the press. Cabot jumped into the race to prove that witches have civil rights and ran a spirited campaign that attracted local support and national media attention. On August 11th, Cabot dropped out citing business commitments, including work on a book. In 88, Cabot established the Temple of Isis, a chapter of the National Alliance of Patheists, through the group, Cabot was ordained reverend and may perform marriages. Some of the books that Laurie Cabot published, I'm going to go ahead and put those titles up on the screen so you can take a look at those. Many of those are still available online. Also still today, you can take classes with Cabot through the Cabot School of Witchcraft. Um, I'll see if I can find a website to put that up on the screen as well. All right, that is a very brief rundown of Lori Cabot. I highly recommend further reading and research. If possible, I also recommend a trip to Salem, Massachusetts. Let's talk about Raymond Howard, who was an English Wiccan. Howard promoted his tradition known as the Coven of Atho through a correspondence course in the early 60s. In the late 50s, Howard lived in Charleswood, Surrey. Uh, let's see here. Howard worked for the psychologist and Wiccan Charles Cardell. I'm going to go into more detail about Cardell in just a moment. Cardell and Howard had a falling out. 
Howard assisted a journalist from the London Evening News in spying on a nocturnal ritual carried out by Cardell and his coven. In March of 61, the, uh, the Cardells took the newspaper to court, accusing them of libel, during which they claimed Howard was a pathological dishonest. Let's talk a little bit about the Coven of Atho in the early 60s. It was a correspondence course. It was Howard's own variant of Wicca. Howard was the leader of a group and termed himself the Fish. The Coven of Atho drew upon Cardell and other sources. Doreen Valiente was a subscriber and, and identified that most of the course came from Dion Fortune's novel, The Sea Priestess. Rudolf Cox, The Book of Signs, and other sources possibly included Gardner's Witchcraft Today, Leland's Ardia, The Gospel of Witches, Lewis Spencer's Books on Atlantis, and Aleister Crowley. Here we see an individual taking what has come before, taking the concepts of others, and repurposing it. Something that, during my research, is very common in modern witchcraft. Similar to the tradition practiced by the Cardells, the Coven of Atho promoted a sevenfold system of ethics. Some of the teachings of the Coven of Atho were the Coven of Atho revered, I'm sorry, referred to magic with the spelling M-A-G-I-C-K. In the late 60s, Howard was running an antique shop in Fielding, Dolling, Norfolk, where he stored a wooden carving of the Wiccan horn god known as the Head of Atho. This had attracted press attention. Howard claimed the head had been passed down to him by pre-existing witches. Another source claims that the head had been given to him by an elderly Romani gypsy called Alicia French. This is also supposedly the woman who initiated Howard into the witch call. Later, Howard's son would reveal the head to be a forgery created by Howard himself. This contradicts an article from March 6, 1967 in the Eastern Daily Press that stated, Laboratory examination had shown the statue to be carved of English oak around 2,200 years ago. In April of 1967, the head was stolen, perhaps by Cardell, and was never recovered. Other valuables in a cash box were left, suggesting the thief only wanted the head. Valiente, in her private diary, wrote that Cardell had stolen the head and buried it in Charlwood. All right, that's all that we have on Howard and the Coven of Atho. This is a very brief synopsis on Howard. If he interests you, I would highly recommend further research. Let's talk about Charles Cardell, who was an English Wiccan. Cardell coined the term Wicca. Cardell referred to followers as Wiccans. Born 1892 in East Sussex as Charles Maynard, Cardell became a major in the British Army serving in India. Cardell became a stage conjurer using the stage name Cardi without any formal qualifications. Cardell was a professional psychologist, dealing especially in people's experiences with the cult during the 1950s and 60s, again, without any formal qualifications. When he changed his name to Cardell, he was joined by a woman known as Mary Edwards. Mary chose to change her surname by deed poll from Edwards to Cardell at the same time. Carl, Charles changed his surname from Maynard to Cardell. They claimed to be siblings. Mary was 20 years his junior. Though not stated, I feel that there was some sort of inappropriate relationship here. They lived together um, on a large estate, Dumble Dean in Charleswood, Surrey. They ran the Dumble Cot Magic Productions, which sold various potions and charms and a product called Moon Magic Beauty Balm. Rumor had it that there was a secret underground temple at Dumbledean, which had been made by converting an old air raid shelter. In a wooden glade, 
I'm sorry, in a woodland glade on their 40-acre estate, there was an altar and a tree with seven wooden Ds on it, underneath which was nailed a wooden fish engraved with the words Moon Magic with a K. Esoteric and pagan symbolism was scattered around their house. This included antlers above the doors, an auk buried in the hatch, and a large seven-pointed star, that would be a septogram, on the ceiling in one of the rooms. The same symbol would, uh, could also be found freely decorating Charles's consulting offices in London. The metalwork gates of Cardell's estate also had large Ds on them. This all seems to relate to the seven Ds of moon magic, a list of principles associated with strange words all starting with the letter D and connected with the geometric symbol of the seven-pointed star. Charles had once written about the seven Ds in one of his articles, and it is clear that for him they summed up his personal philosophy on life. I'm going to go ahead and put the seven Ds on the screen so that we can take a look at those. Five of the seven D words with the exact same associations can be found on an undated list of which words that Gardner appears to have loaned to Jack Barcenel. Cardell was initially friendly with Gerald Gardner and his brick and wood coven. However, Cardell fell out with Gardner in 58. Cardell cited Gardner's excessive publicity seeking as a reason. This is suspect. In 1964, after Gardner's death, Cardell himself published a pamphlet under the pseudonym of Rex Nomorosis, entitled Witch, in which he insulted both Gardner and Doreen Valiente. This pamphlet included sections from the Gardnerian Book of Shadows, which he may have been given while on friendly terms with Gardner, or he may have got from a woman he introduced to Gardner's circle. In 58, Cardell wrote an article published in Light Magazine entitled The Craft of the Wiccans. The article had an accompanying advertisement inviting all genuine members to get in touch. Doreen Valiente, recently split from Gardner, set out to investigate Cardell and Mary. In mid-1958, Valiente met with Charles and Mary and initially was fairly impressed by the credentials they provided. Allegedly, Cardell's mother, Lillian, had been a genuine member and had passed Charles her athame and his sister her bracelet. Doreen wrote to Daffo, um, They are not the same as ours, but bear significant resemblance to be worthy of our attention. A short while later, Cardell invited uh, Doreen Valiente to visit him at his consulting rooms in London. Valiente described them as thus. They were quite splendid, appointed as a sort of a private temple, but when Cardell showed me a bronze tripod, which was obviously 19th century, and tried to tell me that it had been dug up from the ruins of Pompeii, I became rather unhappy. When he showed me a bronze statue of Thor and tried to tell me that it was of a Celtic horn god, I couldn't help myself pointing out that Thor was not a Celtic god, and then he became rather unhappy. Howard went on to propagate the Coven of Atho. Howard later took Cardell to court, claiming that he had sent him an effigy pierced by a needle. All right, that's all that I have on Cardell. If he interests you, I recommend further reading and research. Let's talk about WITCH, or the Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. In the late 60s, which was the name of several related but independent feminist groups active in the U.S. as part of the women's liberation movement. Alternatively, the use of which could mean women inspired to tell their collective history, women interested in toppling consumer holidays, among others. 
In the 1960s, there was division within women's liberation movement of the U.S. The division was between politicos and radical feminists, founders of which were social feminists or politicos. Politicos were social feminists and connected with the oppression of women to capitalism, seeking to ally their leftist cause, such as the New Left, the Black Liberation Movement, the Student Movement, and the Anti-War Movement. Radical feminists did not view women's oppression as a symptom of capitalism and wanted women's liberation to remain independent of the wider leftist movement, which opposed the ideal advocated by radical feminists that their feminist women should campaign against patriarch alone. In 1968, the first witch group was established in New York City in October. In their leaflets, which adopted the witch cult hypothesis by claiming that, they're that they were persecuted as alleged witches in European... Oh, sorry. In their leaflets, which adopted the witch cult hypothesis by claiming that those persecuted as alleged witches in European history had been members of a surviving pre-Christian pagan religion, which the Christian authorities then sought to oppress. In their manifesto, which propagated the claim that 9 million women had been burned to death during the witch trials in the early modern period, this originated with feminist Maltila Jocelyn Gage. This is also called the burning time. Which declared that any woman could become a witch by declaring herself to be one. Which declared that any group of women could form a witch's coven. Various scholars have suggested that embracing the iconography of the witch, the witch movement represented forerunners of various forms of feminist oriented modern paganism, such as Dianic Wicca. That is all that I have for which I highly encourage further reading and research, definitely further research on feminism in general. Let's talk about Monique Wilson, a.k.a. Lady Alwyn, which was her craft name. Wilson was a prominent witch and a member of Gerald Gardner's inner circle. Born Monique Marie in Hepong, Vietnam in 23, possibly 1928. There's some discrepancy in um, age here. Wilson is perhaps best known for initiating Raymond Buckland and helping him spread Wicca to the U.S. Wilson largely became an outcast in the witchcraft community towards the end of her life. Her father was an officer in the French Navy. Wilson met Gardner as a child and referred to Gardner as Uncle Gerald. In 1939, Wilson's father was killed. She then fled to Hong Kong. Uh, Wilson witnessed the death of her father at the hands of communists. Wilson became known as Britain's new queen of the witches, a claim that she never refuted and at times embellished. Wilson hus Wilson's husband was a Scotsman named Campbell Wilson, uh, who was an RAF commander. His craft name was L-O-I-C. I'll go ahead and put that up on the screen. She also had a daughter named Yvette. Um, Yvette's craft name was Morven. During the 60s, Wilson lived in Scotland as a pea farmer with her husband. Also during this time, Wilson wrote Gerald Gardner asking for guidance in establishing a Wiccan presence in Scotland. Monique Wilson found many similarities between the goddess worship of the craft and her familiarity with the figure Kowon Yin from her upbringing in Vietnam. Gardner referred to Monique and her husband to his friend Charles Clark. Clark initiated Monique and her husband and their young child. In 61, the Wilsons founded their own coven in Perth. Wilson would become the high priestess of covens in Scotland. Wilson would be the last high priestess under Gardner. In 63, Gardner and the Wilsons initiated Raymond Buckland and his wife Rosemary 
um, onto the craft. Buckland would be very important to the modern witchcraft, and we'll talk about Buckland in another part of this series. In 64, shortly before his death, Gardner named Monique his heir. Gardner died, of course, at sea, left Monique Wilson the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in the Witch's Meal in Castletown on the Isle of Man. He also left her his cottage, a collection of swords, daggers, magical working tools and objects, numerous notebooks, papers, and important documents. The Wilsons quickly moved in and purchased the Attaches Witch's Kitchen restaurant in hopes to make the museum a financial success. In 1969, the News of the World newspaper ran a sensationalized story about the Wilsons' daughter, Yvette, claiming that she was being abused and forced to take part in witchcraft rituals. This resulted in Yvette being placed under the protection of a probation officer for three years. In 73, Wilson sold the museum and its contents to Ripley's, believe it or not. Because of this, Wilson faced criticism from the Wiccan community for her perceived betrayal. Eleanor Bone, who we talked about in the last part of this series, was not happy with the Queen of the Witches title, much in the same way she was not happy with Alexander's using the King of the Witches title. With the press and much of the Wiccan community said against her, Wilson started drinking rather heavily. After this, Monique distanced herself from the Wiccan community. In 82, she dies. The daughter Yvette renounces witchcraft and Wiccan beliefs and will not discuss her mother's life. All right, that's all we have on Monique Wilson. As always, I highly recommend further re reading and research. And that's all that we have for this episode of the Metaphysical Emporium. The next part of this series will be coming soon. Stay safe. Stay enchanted.